right, thanks for coming and also thank you to uh, Riota and uh, Sebastian and Chris for hosting me here. It's already been wonderful. We had a wonderful dinner last night, wonderful discussions. Um, so I was, uh, I promised to talk about privacy, but then I figured out that my postdoc, Mijun Park, actually very recently visited Microsoft and gave that talk. So I thought I'm not going to repeat that because that's uh, silly. So at uh, last minute, I decided to change um, to some other research we do in Amsterdam. Um, and I'm going to talk about generalizing convolutions uh, for deep learning. Um, so I should say that um, part of the research that you'll see today about graph convolutions was uh, funded by, uh, by SAP. Um, so if you closely look at the success of uh, deep learning, I think you see two patterns. Um, you know, one of them is that convolutions are really stealing the show in the sense that if you have uh, sort of image data or high frequency sort of signals like speech, um, then convolutional neural networks are really the architecture that is improving, you know, all the performances in the, in the, in, on, the, on the sort of competitions. Um, and so we thought, okay, well, if that's the sort of the, 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 sort of the, the architecture that's improving <coughs> things, maybe we should think about generalizing and thinking harder about what these convolutions do and see if we can actually generalize them to new uh, situations. So I'll be, talk about, I'll be talking about using uh, symmetry groups um, instead of just translational symmetries on which normal convolutions are based, can we extend this to sort of larger groups and also be talking about how would you do convolutions on graphs? Um, so this is probably, you know, an insult to most of you um, to explain this, but there's only one slide. So, um, you know, this is a convolutional neural net. Um, you have a patch a little filter here that's being that you're sliding over the image like here um, and then you know you take an inner product of that part of the image with your filter and you get some response here and you do this many times for many filters so you get sort of these filter maps um, and then you repeat it so uh, after this you often do a subsampling like a max pooling approach uh, to, to make the images like smaller and then you repeat, so you do another s filtering operation, you know, on each one of these, and so you get a larger set of filters, then you subsample again, right? And as you go at the very end, you'll have a representation that you'll then feed into a normal sort of linear classifier to predict whatever you're interested in. Um, so what you observe is when you do that, and you learn, learn these filters, that the filters at the sort of lower levels, they, be they are become etched, Detector is basically very simple uh, sort of filters. And then as you go deeper, these filters become more abstract and uh, sort of starting to model concepts like entire faces or parts of faces if you train them on a face data set. Now there has been, uh, so I recently, uh, yesterday I was uh, very inspired also by Chris's talk on healthcare. Um, and, you know, that's also part of, my, part of my motivation to work on things like this. Healthcare is, uh, for me, also very motivating to work on. And there's been three advances, um, very recently, in fact, um, that might have caught your attention. And, each, and in each three of those, uh, what you'll see is that the algorithm, based on convolutions, it's a convolutional neural net, is beating or, or performing or operating at least as good as, as human experts. So the first one here um, is a dermatology application where the Stanford sort of authors, they collected a data set of 130,000 images of skin lesions of some, of some sort. And then they trained a deep convolutional architecture to predict 757 possible classes. Um, so they trained this and then they compared it. So what makes this study in particular interesting is not so much that they did this, I think, but that they compared it with order 25 dermatologists, which are sort of, you know, really well-trained dermatologists. And what you see here is this, uh, this is from the paper, 
uh, so that the, this is the specificity versus sensitivity graph. The blue line here is the, so the algorithm sort of operated at all possible operating points, and the red dots are the humans, right? And if you're below, you're doing worse than, than, the, than the, the system. And in, in you know, three different conditions, they work really hard at making this fair, asking the right kind of questions and such. And mostly, I think there's one guy or girl maybe that does better, um, but you would definitely see here that the, uh, the algorithm works a lot better than the average dermatologist. And I think, you know, and, and in this case, the labels came from biopsies, so there's ground truth above and beyond the labelings that humans can give. And so it's very interesting to see that, you know, with enough data, you can now train these models to actually perform better uh, than humans. There's also an interesting result that when they operate together, when they sort of uh, help each other, then the performance gets even better. So there's also the errors are still a little, little orthogonal and complementary. So this is the second example. This appeared in the, nut, in the Dutch news. Um, so unfortunately it's in Dutch, but I'll explain. Uh, this is uh, a system that was trained by Google um, together with a group from uh, University of Nijmegen um, where uh, they fed in these pathology slides, which is a very large you know, image uh, with tissue, stained tissue with a lot of cells in it. And you need to detect whether certain parts of that image contain uh, sort of a, a tumor. And uh, again, they sort of trained a neural net, and uh, so here they sort of selected out these sort of regions that are, you know, predicted to be tumor. Um, and comparing the algorithm against the pathologist, again, the pathologist scored 73% and the algorithm 89%. So again, another example where the algorithm is surpassing on this sort of limited domain, well-defined limited domain, I should say, surpassing a uh, human on a task which is really very boring and uh, time-consuming, right? Um, and then the third example is in retinopathy, where you take an image of your retina and uh, you are trying to detect lesions on the retina that are indicative of diabetes. And again, uh, this was trained, and when you compare it, you know, in this case, I think the labels are provided by the humans themselves, so it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's going to be very tough to actually beat the humans. But if you look at the curves, again, pretty much on par, right? Now, what, is, what have these three things in common? These, three, these are all very recent results, so I feel we're on the cusp of these algorithms, at least in this domain of convolutional neural nets, surpassing human behavior. What do they have in common? The first thing which I found very interesting is that they are all based on exactly the same neural net. So all of these groups grabbed this Inception V3 neural net from the shelf and fine-tuned it using on their particular domain. Now this algorithm is trained on your, you know, your pictures of your family and your vacation, right? So it's a very, very different domain, um, but still is good enough to fine-tune it and to come up with a state-of-the-art algorithm. And the other thing is what I want to talk to about today is that in each one of these three domains, um, if you rotate the image, or if you flip the image, you mirror the image, it's just a fine, you know, could, could have been another image that you would be part of the data set, right? You know, this or this is both a skin lesion, this or this is still, you know, a perfectly fine pathology slide, and this and this is still a fine eye, uh, retina, right? And so the identity of the object really doesn't change or is invariant relative to translations uh, rotations and, and mirror symmetries. So this is the topic that we studied together with uh, Taco Cohen, who's been driving this um, project forward. Um, and so the, the question that we ask ourselves here is, you know, how can we improve these convolutional neural nets by exploiting these symmetries better, right? Now, a normal convolutional neural net well, let, let, you know, it's based on translation symmetry, so it's baked into the convolutional architecture. So shouldn't we also bake rotations and mirror or maybe other symmetries into the convolutions as well? Right? So you can ask a question, what makes a convolutional neural net such a sort of effective architecture? Um, and so the, the first thing is weight sharing, and that has to do with translational symmetry. 
right? It's like you don't care exactly where you detect an object, as, you know, uh, the, the object will remain the same if it's in a different position. The identity of the object doesn't depend on where you detect it in the image. And so that's implemented by basically having a filter or a template that you slide over the image, right? And so really the number of parameters is quite limited because you have these small uh, sort of pe yes, filters that you can sort of share or, or, across the entire image. The other one is, uh, is, I think, more deep, and people have only recently started to think about this, is um, equivariance. And I'll talk about more about this, but, e but equivariance we mean that if I change something in the input, let's say I translate it or I rotate it, that the filter responses in deep inside the neural net have a very predictable transformation as well. And the reason why this is important is that if I, you know, if I take a filter, right, and I'm looking for something in the image, right, the convolution really only works if, if, I, if I then shift the object, then I can use the same filter again. Right? So I can use the filter to detect something here or here or rotate it. Now if you stack these things, this property will have to hold at every level of the neural net. Right? Because if I, if I have some filter that tries to detect something in a, in, a, in, a, in a latent representation or a hidden representation, and I shift it, I want the same filter to be able to detect it wherever it occurred. So that's the equivariance, and I think that's a very powerful principle. You could also ask yourself, why do we actually need, um, you know, why don't we actually just think about invariance? Or if, if we care about, you know, we don't want to be confused by, you know, transformations because after all, an object doesn't change identity if I change it to another place. Why don't I just find myself invariant um, features? And, you know, that's kind of uh, what we call the Picasso effect, that if you have invariant features, then this is a perfectly fine, you know, reconstruction of a body because it's just scrambled around body parts, right? But the, but the neural net won't notice because everything is invariant. So equivariance, you know, keeps the geometry of the image or the relations between the different parts um, sort of in, you know, encoded through uh, the different layers of the neural net. Okay, so here is a picture of what equivariance means. Um, so when I write this, so this is from a, a blog that was created by some people, I'll have a, have a, a reference later on. Um, so here's my little filter, and this filter is really detecting edges in the image. And here is, uh, let's say, an image that I'm, trying, that I'm convolving with this thing, right? And now at the same time, I'm sort of moving the bar around, translating it around, and this is the filter response. And as you see, if I move the bar, the filter response also moves. Right? So the translation is sort of happening at the image level, but also at the filter response level. Now, if you look at a rotation, that's very different. So if you take this uh, filter, you convolve it with this, but then you rotate it, now the filter response changes a lot. So it's not the rotated version of, of this thing here. Right? And so if I, let's say, I now have another filter at the next level that tries to find you know, this particular, you know, let's say, it, it, it tries to detect a long bar at a particular distance, right? It can't detect it here because it doesn't see it, right? Even if it rotates its own filter, it won't see it because it's a very different response, right? So, th so the second one we, is, is not equivariant. It's, an it's a negative example. It's, it's, a, it's an example of something that's not equivariant. So this one is an old movie from Jan McCoon's website where you can see that um, translation, so here are the filter responses, the translations is perfectly equivariant, but if you rotate, you can see things change as things rotate, right? And that's exactly the thing we're trying to avoid. So the solution is actually quite simple. Um, and uh, so this is the paper we wrote here in ICML 2016. So this is the blog that has sort of a nice explanation um, and some of these GIF, and there's another paper by these people from DeepMind which did very similar work. So if this is a normal convolution, right, where we, trans we, take a, we take a patch and we translate it over the image, then a convolution which also encodes for four uh, sort of rotation symmetries 
is basically operated by you, 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 you run your normal convolution first, then you rotate your patch, and then you create a new filter map. Right? And then you convolve again, and then you, up, you rotate again, and then you create another filter map, and then you go here. So with one filter, you're now creating four, a stack of four filter maps. Right? So that's different. Nor, this one creates one filter map. This one creates four filter maps. Um, and um, so how does that sort of work more technically? So um, basically you can think of a translation, you can define a translation of an image as sort of an operator T, which operates on an image F, that's defined as the evaluation of F at X minus S. So in other words, the inverse translation on the image, you know, on the coordinates of the, of the image. Right, so, that, so that you can work out that that actually is exactly what that operator does. So in other words, this is a, a sort of translation t21, so you translate it, you know, two to the right, one down, right? That's, uh, that's what this thing implements. Now a convolution, an or the ordinary convolution that we know, you can sort of write it as you apply this operator t, which translates a filter patch psi, right, in all possible positions s, and then the, uh, you know, the outcome of that, which is the translated filter, you take the inner product with the image F, and then you, you, know, you sum over all, uh, over all positions. Now, for group convolutions, it's very similar, right? For group convolution, instead of having <coughs> a translation, you now say, okay, so I, I, I first devised this uh, operator T, let's say for a rotation, or any, any group element R applied on F, that's the same as F applied on R inverse X. So the, the rotation of the, of the opposite on X itself. So this is the operation T defined. So in other words, T, if you sort of visualize what T does on this F, it just rotates the image um, left. So now the G convolution is defined as you take your filter psi, you apply your operator T on group element G for all group elements G, and then whatever comes out, you take the inner product with your image F, and you report the inner product as a new value. Right? So if you think of this, so this now group could be both translations and rotations. So you first get all the outputs for your translations, and then you you'd rotate by 90 degrees, and then you get your next filter map, and your next filter map, and your next filter map. So that's four filter maps. Okay, so now we're going to show that that thing is actually equivariant in a particular way. Um, so you take the inner product of your filter with, say, let's say, this object, with this image here. Right? And now, remember that we now have four filter maps as the outcome of that. Right? So here is the filter map applied you know, in a particular orientation, then you rotate your, your filter, and then you get your next filter map. You rotate again, and you get it here, and you rotate it again, and you get this one. So these are the four filter maps that come out of convolving you know, with a group convolution, that image with that patch. Okay, so now what's happening is now I'm going to rotate the original image, and now I want to show equivariance. It's a bit hard to follow, but what's happening clearly, if you rotate this thing, clearly you can see sort of the shape, the contours of the L rotating as well, right? So that's, but it's not exactly this, you know, this is a different image than this, right? So it rotates, but it's these four different images. Now what's happening is that, let's try to track this guy here. As you rotate, it, 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 it rotates around this particular circle. You know, it's here, now it's here, now it's here, etc. Right? So what happens is that as you rotate an image, not only do you rotate the filter map, you also permute between the four layers, these, these four filter maps. Right? So there's an additional operation, not just do you rotate, but you also have to sort of permute these four filter maps. And in this sense, therefore, this thing is equivariant, because you now know precisely what the transformation is. And the equation of equivariance is like this. If you take your, let's say if you take your 
this is your patch, your, your filter, you convolve it with your image F, and then you transform that, which is this outcome here. That should be the same as transforming the image and then applying the filtering, right? That's the definition of, um, of uh, sort of equivariance, and it, in, it involves this permutation or this, you know, between these filter maps. So uh, Taco worked with these groups here. So he has a rotation element, two translation elements, an X and Y direction, and a flip. And that's the group uh, P4M. Now, in order to sort of generalize what we just did to sort of this more complex group, it's quite useful to, th to sort of look at this Cayley diagram. And basically, a Cayley diagram sort of is a picture of how a group operates. So this is this group where we have rotations and mirror symmetries, so not the translations. So you start with an F, and if you rotate, you follow this blue line. So this is a rotated one, and you rotate again, you rotate again, you rotate again. Right? But you can also flip. So if you flip, you go here, and if you flip again, you go back. Right? But from here, you could also rotate, and now note that you actually move in the opposite direction. Once you have flipped, rotation sort of reverses and goes in the other direction. Now, this is a group, which means you cannot escape this diagram, because every sequence of group operations is still a group operation and leaves you in the same set of operations. So this is, a, you know, whatever you do, you'll stay at some node in this graph. Okay, so then the sort of more general setup for equivariance is as follows. So these are now all the filter responses <coughs> to a, um, a filter where the filter was rotated and flipped, right? So you have like eight copies now of this filter because you've, you've, you've rotated it and you flipped it. And these are all the responses of this F, you know, image to all these flipped and rotated filters. And now what we need to show is that if I operate with my T operator on it, which is rotation, so I now, now I rotate my image F. Now, clearly, all of these filter maps rotate as well. But the additional thing is that you should see is that this image now moves here. So this image here has now moved there. So if you think of each these eight as now a stack of eight filter maps, what has happened is that you know, you know, th there's been sort of a cyclic reordering of these filters in this filter map. And with a, with a mirror symmetry, you can see it here. So everything gets mirrored, but also this guy now moves there. So this guy now moves there, right? So this is a different permutation on this stack of filter maps. So again, within these sort of groups, you can see now that um, it, this uh, G convolution, which does eight convolutions, again is um, equivariant. Um, so some results, uh, there's many more results, but um, these are just some illustration of it. So if you have the translation group um, on these two data sets, you get these results. This is normal convolutional neural net. If you swap in this P4, which is like these four uh, sort of rotations, if you add them, you know, you get a significant reduction. If you add mirror symmetry, again, you get a significant reduction. And similar for ResNet, you could do something similar. Right? So really this is like you got a convolution, you swap in a new definition of a convolution, and you can get a much better result. Right? And, um, and the idea, I think, you know, important to, to remember is now if you think of an image basically as a lot of data because you can train that particular filter on each one of the positions of the, of the image. Now you have multiplied your data by a factor of four or eight again because you now also provide as adi additional data the rotated images and the flipped images. It's not exactly the same in fact as, um, as data augmentation. It's actually it's a different but it's baked into, the, into this. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it, it, it acts as some kind of data augmentation because it's, it's something that's much more data efficient. And so what can we learn from this? Now, this is work that came after, so I, I won't go into uh, many of the details, but you can show that, um, you know, as you go deeper in these neural networks, the uh, subspaces that sort of trans transform into each other, right? I've talked about eight filter maps which sort of swap places, they transform into each other under these symmetry transformations. 
Um, as you go deeper into the network, these spaces get smaller. And clearly towards the end, you don't want any of that anymore because the actual label, the prediction of the label must be invariant, right? Because the label shouldn't change if I do a symmetry transformation. So you can think of this disentangling maybe as something like this. There's a number of dimensions <coughs> in your latent, in your hidden space. And if I apply my transformations that keep the object the same, let's say I rotate a an image of a dog around, then I'm, I'm moving on some orbit in this space of, uh, sort of, of hidden activations, right? And so in this direction, you know, I'm, I'm still the same object. But there's other directions in the space where I basically move from one object to the new object. I, I move from a cat into a dog in some sense, right? And so it's quite easy to find a classifier that separates this because you just have to separate you know, these two things from each other. Right? So disentangling is basically the idea that these dimensions start to sort of become independent. This dimension here uh, becomes sort of independent of these two dimensions. Okay, so that was the first part. Um, now uh, we move to the next generalization, which is, yeah, sure. So the equivariance means that the information about the transform is kept in the network yeah. until some point. Do, yeah. do you know any example where that's actually useful at the end instead of being invariant at the end? Okay, so in the end, you'll have to be invariant, right? Because in the, so uh, the last step is, some, is a linear classifier and you want your linear classifier to be able to separate things nicely. Um, so. I think the most important thing is that you want to keep the information about sort of relative positions of things as long as you can in, in, the, in the lower layers of the network as you build to the higher layers and then only have this invariance at the top of the network. Um, yeah, so, so, so the question was, do I know where it's useful? So or? I guess the point then is like that you have different parts and then the relative orientation yeah. of the parts matters to identify the object at the end. You keep, a, you, you keep geometrical information in the, in the latent or the sort of hidden representation of the object. It, and it, but as you go deeper, things become more invariant, basically. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Is there an extension that you've explored to this method where the, um, the rotations you're exploring are not just the 90 degree flips that fit nicely yeah. within the sampling grid, but continuous rotations? Yeah, so Taco and uh, Jorn Peters have worked on uh, something like, uh, they put it on a hexagonal grid, and so then you have six uh, rotations. Um, so the reason <coughs> that they want to really stick with uh, grids is that if, if you take continuous groups or stuff like that, then you have to start to interpolate. Um, and this interpolation causes small little errors, which unfortunately sort of accumulate as you go deeper into the network. So you want to sort of avoid these sort of interpolation operations. Um, but you know, this hexagonal grid is something that has a, has a larger group, basically, that, that it entertains. Is it somebody in the back? The same question. <coughs> yeah? So you, uh, you mentioned that at some point you want the invariance. How do you achieve that invariance? You just do max pooling over the group, or how do you get the Yeah, that's a good point, actually. So. Um, so at every iteration, you can actually uh, do max pooling, for instance, over the rotation. So you do, do not only have to do max pooling over the translations, but you can also do max pooling over the rotation uh, group. And you can sort of increase your invariance as you go up. Yeah. Have you thought of something similar but applied to scale? Yeah, scale is very difficult because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a group that is non-compact. Um, and so... Uh, so you, you 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 create sort of new information, or you so, so you, you move out of your range in some sense if you apply scales. So as I understand, scale is a lot harder to implement. Um, also, it's, I guess hard to put on a grid and stuff like that as well. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, data augmentation, right? And the, the obvious link with data augmentation. Um, but in that augmentation, you would flip the whole image, right? Yeah. Whereas using the flip of the filter, which will be applied to different, it's going to like <coughs> each part of the image uh, with that flip instead of the whole image. So that augmentation will fall under your like generalization, right? Yeah, so the thing is you can, it turns out that flip, you know, rotating the image and rotating the filter is, is similar. So it contains the same information. 
Um, but, it, but, the, but if you think about just rotating the image, right, if you don't actually do a G convolution, then your, your filter, you will still have to learn four filters for basically the, uh, the structure that you learn under the four rotations. So when you do the G convolution, you basically get one single filter that's applied at all orientations. So you can pull a lot more information into that one filter. Right? Because other, if you just keep the same filter, you don't ro rotate the filter, what's happening is that you provide more information, but you still have to, let's say, in, if you're detecting an edge, you have to detect an edge on the disk and then and a, a, an oh, edge yeah. like this. Yeah. So you have to basically learn four filters instead of one. Yeah. So if you take, say, the digit six and you translate it globally, it's still the digit six. But if you write up a sheet of rubber, you sort of stretch the rubber yeah. a little bit, it's still the digit six. And that accounts for some of the sort of natural variation of handwriting. And it seems as if because of the local <coughs> nature of the connectivity, the oscillating convolution subsampling seems to capture that sort of local yeah. translation yeah. errors. We're using the same sort of structures to implement rotation invariants because they're, sort of, they're slightly different. I, mean, I think they're very like, different, actually, because these d small deformations are not, this is not what, this is more like global uh, transformations. And it's true that the sort of uh, max pooling actually takes care of sort of invariance to local deformations. Um, I feel that it could be captured by a similar framework, but you then have to think about local gr groups, local groups, which is a whole different, and then we get to gauge, you know, to gauge theories, which is on our agenda, but a bit more difficult. Just following up, isn't a rotation six quite like a nine? Yeah, so, so clearly, to... yeah, so clearly, um, in that case, uh, that's not a symmetry, right? And you shouldn't apply it because it's not a symmetry, so. Uh, yeah. It's, it's fun, but I have yeah, more slides. <laughs> Maybe if... <laughs> yeah. um, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, about a graph convolutions. And here the inspiration comes from, from knowledge graphs. Um, so I think knowledge graphs um, should be part of sort of um, a future AI system in some sense because it captures all, all our knowledge of the world. Um, and a knowledge graph basically has a lot of entities and their relations between them, right? And as I understand, uh, Riotta is also doing research on this, on embedding, you know, these knowledge graphs into a latent space and then sort of doing classification or link prediction or whatever, starting from that latent space. So this will be very similar, but then based on graph convolutions, right? So there's a lot of graph structured data in the world. Uh, so I just already mentioned knowledge graphs. Um, but there are citation networks, protein-protein interaction networks, you know, clearly the World Wide Web, social networks, and, and so on. Now, um, so let's revisit again a normal convolution, but maybe from a slightly different point of view. So here's a normal convolution. So let's say that you have sort of some features living, you know, on these nodes then you can think of a normal convolution with n input layers and n output layers um, as <coughs> basically each one of these nodes uh, transforming their feature value with a, linearly with some matrix W and then sending that information to the central node, summing it all up, and then pushing it through nonlinearity to get the value of the central node at the next iteration. Right? And you do this for every node. But importantly, each node can send, can transform that data using their own weight matrix W. They don't have to be the same, right? So if H would be just a number, this is basically, these colors are basically your filter values. But the problem is that um, on a regular graph, that works. But on an irregular graph, um, that's a stretch. Because, so let's say you're in this situation, on a graph that looks like this, so let's say you order your notes, like if you go from left to right, you start with red and then green and then blue. Now sometimes you have sort of more neighbors, so then you have to invent a new color. But sometimes, you know, if you look at this, you know, this graph is actually the same as this graph. I just moved this here, but now the ordering has changed. And if I give a different weight value, a weight matrix, then you know this is computing something different, right? So we have, an, in, in some sense, we have a symmetry in this graph, which is moving these nodes around. Um, and so our um, our 
convolution should respect that particular symmetry. Um, and so the logical conclusion from that is that you should really send the same message or the same, you should multiply the feature vector on a neighboring node using the same shared weight matrix W for each one of your neighbors. Right? So in other words, uh, you take your value H on each one of your neighbors, you multiply them by a single shared weight matrix, and you normalize them because, you know, to compensate for the fact that sometimes you have more and sometimes you have less neighbors, you add them all up, you add sort of your own self-interaction to it, you push it through a sigmoid, and you have your value at the next le level. Now, people have commented on this, and they have said, well, that's, if you look at this in a regular graph, that's really not a very powerful feature map, right? It only has two numbers, and what can you do with it? And it turns out for regular graphs, you cannot do very much with it. It's not very powerful at all. But for irregular graph, it turns out actually this is a good idea. So let's first stack things together. So, uh, so now we have our graph. For every node, we collect our <coughs> evidence from our neighbors, and we add our own evidence to it. So we do this for every node, right? And then we push it through a nonlinearity. Now we have our h values, or latent, uh, or yeah, your your hidden state vectors at the next level, and you keep on doing this until at the very end you have a embedding for every node in the graph. <coughs> And clearly, the, so this node you know, will see more of its environment or will receive information from more of its environment the more layers you have in this neural net, right? Because the, so the receptive field grows as you push through more layers. <coughs> so here's an application of how you could use that kind of thing. It's a really simple operation, um, but it's a direct generalization of convolutions on a graph. Um, and here's how you could apply that to semi-supervised learning. So let's say you're, you're on a graph. Uh, on these particular nodes, you have labels. And on the rest of the graph, you do not have the labels. Right? So then um, the usual thing that people do is you take your normal loss on the labeled nodes and you add a regularization loss, basically saying that on you know, nodes that are connected or in some neighborhood, you want that function, that label function, to be smooth, right? You want, you want to have the same function f. And so this is, you know, the, the, you can <coughs> express this in terms of a la graph Laplacian, and this is a, you know, a well-known algorithm for semi-supervised learning. Uh, so what we do instead, okay, so here's another set of sort of more recent ways of solving this, which is you have a two-step pipeline. Uh, first, you have some algorithm to embed your graph into a latent space, and then after that, you train a classifier on the embedding. Right? And here's a bunch of examples of people that do that. Um, now, of course, it's suboptimal be re because we really want the embedding to be optimal or you know, to be tuned to the actual classification task that we're trying to solve. Right? And so really what we want to do is an end-to-end -end sort of solution. And now what we do is we basically push our input through our, gr our graph encoder, and then at the nodes where we have information, we put a cross-entropy loss, and then we do backpropagation. So um, what's interesting is that, uh, so going back to this question of whether this is, you know, this is this very limited sort of operation of just pushing, you know, this information on the, on the links of the graph, is this useful at all? So if we took at this, if we look at this particular network, and we take a random uh, graph, a, a, a sort of, in other words, uh, sorry, we take a graph encoder, as I just explained it, but with random filters. So we don't train anything. Then you already get a quite interesting embedding without doing anything, without learning anything. Right? Of course, this is not true for a regular graph. In a regular graph, you wouldn't get anything interesting out. But this encodes already something interesting about the graph structure. And it's related to this algorithm, which is called weisfeiler lehmann algorithm. That works as follows, it's quite similar. You start off with some features on the nodes, and then at every iteration, you just send that information, you just propagate the information you know, to, uh, you know, from the neighbors to yourself, and then you hash it 
you, you provide a hash code, and then you repeat until the whole thing is stable. Now it turns out that that algorithm is actually already quite good at sort of distinguishing different graphs. Right? It will come out with a different encoding for graphs which are different. Um, so we basically, in this view, we replace this particular operation by this GCN operation, but now we can actually train these weights. So it's very similar <coughs> as what this is, but we have trainable weights and we have a nonlinearity, so we can actually do back propagation through this thing. Right? And then if you sort of run that um, and you train it, so you can see that uh, you get a much nicer sort of embedding um, out of it than if you would do it for a random uh, network. So the, what I find interesting is that this is a really simple idea. Right? You know, here is again so the, the equation. So you have uh, your A is your connectivity matrix. You multiply it by your features on your node. Um, that will give you sort of your local propagation rule. Then you multiply by your matrix W. Uh, you put a ReLU and you repeat this process. Right? Uh, so it's very simple, um, but in fact it beats um, all other methods, which is really what was interesting for us. Right? So here is basically our, our results on a semi-supervised learning problem, where these were all sort of recently published methods on this uh, task. Um, and what you see is that you know, these are really quite big differences. Um, and so I think we got really lucky here um, and tried something that um, other people probably have, would have tried after us uh, a couple of months later. Um, but it really is something that, that happens to work very well. And it's also very efficient. Right? And here's, a, here's the embedding. If you pass it through a T-SNE algorithm, you can see that it has nicely recovered um, sort of the classes and projected them in on a nice uh, sort of space. OK, so that's, yeah. Because this is two layer, does that yeah. mean that information only propagates two steps? Yeah, um, and that's interesting. So uh, we've tried, obviously, also deeper networks, um, but we didn't get an improvement. So it's basically the two layer is basically optimal for this. Um, so it may be deep as a stretch here, <coughs> but um, so for now, that's basically the, for, and it also obviously depends on the network structures. I think for different types of networks, more layers will help or not. For these problems, two layers were basically what did work best. Yeah. And the two layers have uh, separate weights, or like in the, in the Weisbrot Lima yeah. algorithm, you have you had always the same hash function, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the, the general case. Right. So you have for for each one of your neighbors, you use the same weight value, um, and then you have your own. But then at the different layers, you have different weights as well. Um, so apart from the gating mechanism, how is the GCN different from a gated graph neural network? It's pretty similar. Uh, there they use, um, let's see, um, I have to think about precisely. I think there's details that are different, but I, I can only say that that model came out about the same time, and it's quite similar in the way it operates. Um, so, yeah. Um, OK, so, uh, so now the next task is to do uh, link prediction. Actually, you had a question, right? Or? So it's okay. Oh, okay. Um, so the next task is uh, sort of link prediction, which is uh, you could think of as the sort of unsupervised sort of autoencoder equivalent of uh, in in this framework. So in that case, you start as input with your x and you know your connectivity, which is basically your graph. So that information is being mapped into an embedding of your nodes, right? And then at the next iteration. You, so that's the encoder, and then you need a decoder that then takes the embedding and predicts the, uh, the links, you know, the presence or absence of links in this graph. Right? And so basically what we do is, again, uh, quite similar. So we take this N, so you came from X and A, you go to Z, and from Z to A. So that's the typical you know, autoencoder picture that people draw. Now for the encoder, we simply use exactly the same graph encoder. It's exactly the same thing. And then for the decoder, we take something truly simple, which is you take the um, outer product of ZI, or the inner product of Z and Z, you know, neighbor, uh, and then push it through a sigma to get the probability of, of a link at that particular position. Right? Um, now, you could imagine that you could make this more sophisticated and get better results, but this is what we did for now. And then if you run that, you'll get this kind of uh, 
you know, embedding. And again, so we tried it, um, this quite simple algorithm, and um, compared it with some other algorithms, and um, it was quite easy to get state of the art. So there is something in this graph encoder, I think, that's really working very well. Although I should also say that um, uh, one of the reasons why this works so well is you can very easily um, incorporate features on your nodes. Because there's basically you, you, multi you sort of transport these features over your links. And for some of these other methods, that's not so easy. Um, and so uh, you can use this particular framework also to train better recommender systems. Now, what's a recommender system? Uh, so you have some people interacting with items that say these are ratings for these items. Um, and then you also add to this your features for your user and the features for your items. All right? And then you can represent this matrix simply as a graph where every user that has rated an item has a link. And there's five types of links now. Right? One link for every rating. And note that you can actually have these features here. They, they live on the nodes of the graph. And now you just apply exactly the same framework for the, um, uh, you know, for the autoencoder part. But now you do it on this bipartite graph. And you have different sort of uh, link, links that you have to take into account. <laughs> so this is the original. So if you have x, i, and x, u, and your rating matrix as input. You then map to an embedding, an embedding for, for, for both users and items. And then from the embedding, you map back to predict the ratings, or which are basically the links um, for, the, for, the, for the network. So it's, it's, it's completely analogy, analogous to what we just did. So we tried this. Uh, this is still work in progress. Uh, it's not yet state of the art, but you know, it's pretty good. I would say we're here. There's a bunch of recent papers that came out that, that are still beating it. Um, so we, I guess we need another ingredient to get to the state of the art. And then the final uh, thing I want to talk about is um, what I started off with, the application of this to knowledge graphs. And uh, this is a quite in, also in a quite immediate uh, sort of application. So here's part of a knowledge graph where you have entities and you have relations between these entities. Right, here's a person, and it's a citizen of the USA. Um, and then, uh, so what we need to do is we need to propagate again. So we want to embed these nodes into, uh, into an embedding space. Again, we do exactly the same thing. So we have a self-interaction, multiply you know, this, the, the value, the feature value of that node times its own matrix. And then for every relation, and now there's a huge number of relations, right? In these knowledge graphs, the number of relations really explodes. Um, and also there's directionality in the graph. And we basically say that you know, an, an edge that points towards you or an edge that points away from you are two different types of relations. So number of relations times two now. So in principle, you would want to do something like this, right? So you have a relation-dependent weight matrix which multiplies this edge. So now this is a very powerful model because now you have a different weight matrix for every relation. In fact, it's too powerful and it's very easy to overfit. So in order to get this to work, you have to expand this W on a, in, in terms of a basis where the basis vectors themselves are not relation dependent. It's just the coefficients which multiply, which combine these, these, these basis matrices which are going to be relation dependent. And now you've reduced the number of parameters significantly Right? And then uh, you can sort of run this uh, in sort of plain vanilla fashion. So in pictures, so you propagate to this node. Right? Now uh, you look at relation one, all incoming nodes. So the one, two, three, four. You look at their activation. You multiply them by, their own, by the matrix W. <coughs> then you look at the outgoing ones for that relation. So there's two, these two, this one, and this one. Look at their activation, multiply it by their own matrix, add it. You look at relation two, right? one incoming. Uh, look at the activation multiplied by matrix, two outgoing, multiply, etc. Have a self loop as well, add everything up, push through nonlinearity, and you have your state at the next iteration, and then you repeat. Okay? And then again, you can do two things. You can do entity classification, which is basically, you know, compute something, um, predict something on nodes, or you can do link prediction, which is, again, very similar to what I just said, predict things on edges. 
Now, I, we have results. Uh, they're on an archive paper, so you can look them up. Um, but I didn't want to bother you with more numbers that are bold. Um, let me just end. Um, so the motivation behind this research was that convolutions seem to be the secret sauce in deep learning. Right? They seem to make things work. And so we decided to dive deeper and see if we can generalize you know, these convolutions on graphs and, on, and, and incorporating more symmetry groups. Um, so we, we extended it to sort of general symmetry groups. Um, so um, we, made, we made sure that these representations become equivariant, and we argue that's a very important property to have in a deep neural net. Um, it's better in the sense that it's sharing more parameters, so it, it's better at, therefore, data. It's, it's training more data efficient, um, and also you can show that if you swap these convolutions into a normal convolution neural net, you actually improve uh, your efficiency. And, and uh, Taco really has very nice code online that you can download and, and play with. He also has some more recent work where he makes the whole thing uh, much more efficient as well. Uh, so you could check that paper out as well. Um, and uh, so we also looked at graph convolutions as fast end-to-end -end, uh, learning. Uh, here, the results are surprisingly good. It's very interesting that such a simple algorithm uh, beats the state of the art. Um, and um, you can think of it as a simplification, basically, as the normal way that people define graph convolutions using a Fourier in a spectral domain. Um, and we've looked at applications to semi-supervised learning and recommenders and knowledge graphs. So, thank you. Um, operations on graphs come up sometimes in discrete um, computational geometry, so for example, polyhedral meshes in computer graphics. And there, it's often important to have the weight matrices have eigenvalue 1, a maximum eigenvalue 1. Yeah. Um, you must have found something similar yeah. when yeah. you tried to go to the deep network. Exactly. That's actually crucial. Um, so you can think of it as you take your Laplacian and you normalize the Laplacian by the inverse of the basically the, the, the diagonal, so the, the, the n degrees, or the square root of the n degrees on both ends. Um, I had these factors c in, you know, when I said 1 over c times the sum, so that's the normalization, and it's exactly that thing that you want to make sure that the eigenvalue is close to 1, because otherwise you get blow up or shrinking too much. So it's a, actually, that's a crucial ingredient um, in this thing. And when you did a linear combination of basis weight matrices, did you somehow have that c? Did you ensure that as well? Um, now, that's a good question. I think it's quite simple in the sense that we don't actually do a spectral decomp, you know, like a compute the eigenvalues and divide by it. It's, I think it's more like we divide by the number of sort of neighbors or something sure. simple like that. So, um, so nothing special, I think, there. Um, but it's a good point. We could check whether that could still improve it. Yeah. Certainly, when you said going deeper didn't help, my first thought was, oh, is, yeah. are those eigenvalues right? <coughs> That's a good point. Uh, I'll, I'll look into that, actually. Yeah. Um, so in the, it's also about the graph example. So uh, you show like these cases of irregular graphs. Is it clear kind of what's the relationship between the nodes and the edges? Like because they all look like, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but they all look like the Facebook graph in the sense that kind of nodes that were similar to each other have similar <coughs> degrees, but then the graph overall is, is not well connected. So I was thinking that if it would be nice to see if there's a relationship between how many layers and the type of graph. Say, if we have a sparse graph, or if we have like yeah. middle communities, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, and, yeah, and so I, I, I mentioned I think that the behavior and the number of layers is, a, is actually probably a function of uh, the properties of the graph. So certain, I mean, clearly if you have a super regular graph like an image, um, you know, we can do many layers. Um, now, um, so for these irregular graph, it might well be that if you get a very densely connected or where you get like some hubs in them, some very sparse parts of the graph, that, that has... Uh, some impact on the number of layers that you can learn. Um, so I wouldn't know. Would have to experiment with it. But um, but it's a good it's a good uh, comment. Thank you.
Some of the classic methods like Laplace and eigenmaps have natural out of sample extensions, but here in your case, is it possible to define an out of sample extension? Yes, but that's exactly the symmetry, right? So, so you can um, because you define basically every you know every node just looks at the sum of the neighbors and they all share the same weight matrix, right? So you could quite easily add a whole bunch of nodes to the graph and connect them at will, and then transport the learned you know, weight matrix to these edges, because you know what it is, right? And then just run with your extension. So, so, there is, so it's related to this fact that you need to share uh, you know, the, the weight matrix for your neighbors. But once you do that, you can very naturally extend out of sample. All right, I guess.